Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to the chair. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to the NICE conference. Um, I'd like to thank, start by thanking Dr. Pramod Jaiswal and the entire team of NICE that has put this together. I think it's a very timely and pertinent discussion to have. Um, the session that we are going to do now is uh, going to uh, be about Nepal and its relations with Great Paz. Um, the, so just housekeeping before we start off, uh, we're going to have about eight to nine minutes for every speaker. We'll be taking questions after. So uh, for the audience that has uh, been kind enough to join us, please uh, leave your questions in the chat box. And I think it's being streamed live as well. So you can also leave them on uh, the Facebook uh, chat thing. Um, uh, so let me just start by uh, putting the roster up. Uh, shall we start with Mr. Chandrika Pandit, who's the planning officer, National Planning Commission. Uh, he's going to be speaking about Nepal's foreign policy patterns towards the regional and extra regional powers. Uh, then we'll do, uh, go with Ms. Prakriti Upreti, who's an independent researcher, and she'll be speaking about Nepal's political and economic ties with great powers. Then Mr. Gaurav Bhattarai, who's faculty at the Tribhuvan University, will be speaking about Nepal's foreign policy behavior in accommodating the interests of major powers, opportunities, and challenges. Then Mr. Hari Prakash Chand, who's a PhD scholar, uh, at the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy at Tribhuvan University. He'll be speaking about major power player in Nepal and Nepal's foreign policy. Then Dr. Saurabh Dhimire, who's an independent researcher, and will be speaking about U.S. engagement in Nepal. And then Ms. Eloise, who's an independent researcher and the former country director of the Planet and Ponds at Development. Uh, and she'll be speaking about French INGOs in Nepal. Uh, let me start with Mr. Chandrika Pandit then. I turn this over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chia. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pomo Jaiswal for, for, and Nice Nepal for providing this opportunity uh, to speak about this uh, Nepal relation with great powers. And I'm going to talk about Nepal's foreign policy pattern towards regional and extra regional power. Basically, this topic is based on my master's uh, dissertation, which uh, uh, while I was uh, uh, graduating from International Christian University, Tokyo. Uh, I have divided my talk within the six part. I will start with background, followed by research puzzle, argument and concept of hedging and hedging theory and Nepal's hedging oper operationalization. And lastly, I will conclude. So in, in regarding background, as you know that uh, Nepal is located in G uh, geostrategic location, and even there is change in power distribution in the region with the rise of the China and emergence of India. And, and even there is, uh, many scholars agree that there is a, a new form of Cold War have been seen these days, and even rivalry and contest of great power in Nepal is easily visible. And uh, there is also, uh, Nepal has to manage a neighbor's security concern within this, uh, in, within this background, uh, it is a big challenge for Nepal to maintain its sovereignty. And so, uh, and uh, I have basically within this presentation, uh, I, I'm going to argue that uh, Nepal has recal recalibrated its hedging strategy. And, uh, and uh, in uh, existing literature, basically regarding Nepal foreign policy pattern, uh, YAM concept, Beijing concept, or balancing relation, or uh, equidistance, uh, equiproximity, non-aligned policy. Th this kinds of policy option has been discussed earlier. But here, I want to uh, discuss from a hedging lens. So what will be the, uh, whether, uh, what types of hedging will be viable option for Nepal? So th that is uh, my area of here concern. For, uh, for defining a regional and extra regional power, I have used here a uh, low institute Asia power index uh, 2020, where India and China is a regional power in case of Nepal, and Japan and US is the extra regional power here. Uh, in, in, regarding concept of hedging, hedging is a, a range of policy to avoid undecided situation, and it is uh, with the state forward alternatives. Uh, it is a behavior to offset risks by uh, pursuing multiple policy option, which is a mutually uh, counting effect at high 
uncertainty is and stx now this is definition given by the kick so it is a range, range of policy this is not only single policy it is a range of policy between pure balancing and pure band organizing uh, within uh, within this topic i have used uh, a lee hedging uh, hedging framework and quick hedging framework a lee hedging pr uh, framework includes uh, economic pragmatism direct engagement soft balancing and hard balancing uh, on the other hand quick hedging includes limited band opening banding engagement economic pragmatism uh, dominance denial and indirect balancing however uh, within uh, in this talk i have not included hard balancing and indirect balancing because nepal is not in position uh, to hedge through hard balancing or in, indirect balancing and even uh, no any document has uh, uh, uh revealed or discussed about uh, this regarding in terms in case of nepal and as you know that nepal is following non aligned policy so th there is no question of hard balancing and in indirect balancing in case of nepal of course there are some push and pull factor of hedging uh, and in, uh, regarding nepal's hedging operationalization uh, um, i have uh, framed uh, uh, Two categories of hedging options. One is risk contingency option. Another is a return maximizing option. Return maximizing option include limited band opening, banding engagement, economic pragmatism, and direct engagement, uh, which is uh, fall under a, a degree of power acceptance. However, uh, on, on the other side, in degree of power rejection, it includes dominance denial and soft balancing. Uh, so I want to mention some cases of limited band opening in case of Nepal. As you know that uh, India and uh, in international community played uh, a creative role in peace process of Nepal. Uh, so it, uh, uh, under leadership or, or uh, activeness of India. So this is a, a kind of uh, limited band opening towards India so that uh, India managed uh, within uh, their interest. And another uh, regarding China, uh, Nepal also supported China as observer status in SAR, and uh, uh, Nepal has already joined BRI uh, uh, regardless of Indian reluctance. And uh, another example of uh, um, uh, limited band opening, though, so uh, one of the Department of Defense of US has uh, published an uh, Indo Pacific report in, uh, in 2019 that's also included uh, a separate chapter for Nepal. And um, US aspire or seeks to cooperate with Nepal in areas of disaster recovery, peacekeeping operation, and defense professionalism and countering uh, uh, terrorism. However, uh, officially, uh, Nepal has not declared um, uh, regarding uh, its um, uh, inclusion in Indo Pacific. Uh, for, uh, another is binding engagement and soft balancing. Uh, as you know, that Nepal is founding member of. Uh, uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Similarly, uh, Nepal as a dialogue partner in Shanghai Cooperation Organization and Nepal engagement with United Nations, other regional organization and international organization. Even Nepal has played proactive role in uh, uh, what you call uh, LDC and uh, LLDCs and even active member of NAM and even uh, strengthening relation with the remittance generating countries or labor receiving states. So these are includes the binding engagement and soft balancing uh, hedging. Another economic prag pragmatism, yeah, we know that uh, Nepal uh, uh, dependent with the trade and even uh, uh, trade with India and China and uh, Indian and Chinese in, in, uh, also investment has increased in Nepal. And uh, also um, uh, ODA from US and Japan is, uh, um, uh, uh, Nepal is gaining ODA from US and Japan regularly. Uh, and another, but not it decided yet. These are very controversial uh, MCC compact as well. This is also part of economic pragmatism earlier. But these days, uh, if uh, now it's a very debatable issue. Uh, it, uh, now, if Nepal is going to um, approve this, this may be moved towards uh, a limited band opening as well. And uh, another is a, a direct engagement. Uh, as you know that Xi Jinping visit in Nepal in. Uh, uh, last of 2019, this is also direct engagement and even a high level visit from um, both India and China. Regarding dominance denial, I, I want to mention three cases of dominance denial. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, during denying the Indian pressure during constitution making of Nepal, uh, 
uh, India has um, say, uh, sent uh, a special envoy to address uh, one pro um, uh, protesting Madhesh um, uh, based political party, but uh, and wanted to delay some process to involve them as well. But uh, the major uh, political party with the majority, uh, they um, uh, already uh, de declared a new constitution. A promul promulgated new constitution, so that that, that is uh, first. Uh, this is the one denying uh, um, uh, cases of dominance denial. Another is a revision agenda of 1953. Uh, uh, different leadership uh, already have uh, uh, agreed to for revision of 1953. Even constitution, the new constitution also mentioned that to um, revise the treaty or agreement. Uh, those uh, the, the old treaty and uh, agreement as well. Another is a publication of new map, uh, including Kalapani, Likyadura, and uh, Little Lake. But uh, behind this all uh, um, a political haze of uh, dominance denial, uh, uh, we easily seen political consensus uh, in terms of all the major political parties. So these are the case. However, during uh, it is a little bit risky for Nepal as well, uh, do, especially during the denying Indian press or during constitution making process. Nepal suffered with the uh, undeclared economic blockade as well. So in conclusion, uh, I want to say that uh, Nepal has uh, calibrated its raising strategy and, uh, and only just non-aligned and equal uh, distance policy are not enough in this change context. And the dual hedging behavior of Nepal is moving toward extra regional power as well with the growing in increment of the great power. And uh, uh, however, uh, in terms of risk contingency hedging option, uh, we, we have found that, I have found that here, uh, only it, it, it has been partially adopted. On the other hand, return maximizing, uh, return maximizing option has been fully adopted. And Nepal foreign policy option are changing as regional powers are more proactive. And rivalry between uh, China with whether it's India, Japan, or US creates more opportunity of hedging for Nepal. With this, I would like to stop here and look forward for your comment and feedback. Thank you so much. Mr. Pandit, congratulations on stellar timekeeping. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. It's a pleasure to also hear about uh, hedging in a, with non-negative aspects. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll discuss it later. Let's move on to the next speaker. Uh, Ms. Prakriti Upreti, would you please take the floor? Yes. Thank you. I'll be sharing the screen with you all. Do you reckon it, there's a problem? Yes. Uh, so, so about uh, the screen sharing. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pramod and NICE team for inviting me. Uh, Prakriti, you could not share yes, your screen. Sorry? Do we have a PowerPoint? We can't see your screen. Yes, I did have a PowerPoint, but for just press the green first open your slide and then press green button. There's some error with my um, system presence, okay. so I don't want to go over that right now. Thank you. Uh, so uh talking about uh, Nepal's practically just a moment. Uh, Pramod, uh, would you want to check? I think there's some issue with the audio. Do you want to try again, Prakriti? There was some disturbance. Uh, Prakriti, maybe you can start now. We have muted everyone. Okay, I'll start. Thank you. Okay. So it's Nepal's political and economic ties with great powers. So Nepal was mostly closed system until 1950s. During 1950s, geopolitical polarity between the liberal democratic nations and the communist nations influenced great powers interest. Ties between Nepal and great powers still influenced 
by that tension. Nepal, on the other hand, always insisted on non-aligned independent foreign policy. So what interest did great powers have in Nepal? During the 1950s, great powers in West, US, UK, Germany, France, and others founded an, founded an alliance to curb communism, spread of communism. Nepal at that time had just been freed from oppressive Rana regime and was economically handicapped. And due to its poor economy, it was susceptible to uprising of communism. So in order to resist the spread of communism, great powers started providing aids that could make visible improvement in living standards. They also backed up monarchy and panchayat system at that time, claiming it to be form of democracy. Since then, great powers have been providing aids to Nepal in form of grants, loans, and technical assistance. Uh, China interest, on other hand, was influenced by its own ideology and Tibet safety from outside world. It also wanted to be sure that Nepal would not be part of Western design that could foster encirclement of China. India's and Nepal's friendship also started uh, in 1950s with cooperation in many sectors. Nepal-India border it is only easy access for Nepal to trade uh, and improve its economy. Further, in India's major interest is also water resource, as all the, all the river system in Nepal makes 46% of Ganges in India. And this shared water resource is a very important factor for both countries to make effective bilateral ties for energy and environment goals. Since then, great powers have been major development partners of Nepal and providing official development assistance or insurance. So how effective is the assistance uh, provided uh, by great powers? So OD is highly fragmented in Nepal. There's always shifting of sectoral priorities by donors. This variations from commitments disbursement is less than the commitment. There's no country owned a lot of time. A lot of aid is directly given to INGO setup. There's no proper use of countries. Uh, this dev the development partner alignment is high at strategic level, but at project level it's not so strong. And in, come, and in recent years, the grants have been decreasing, which used to be up, up till 60% of OD in the 50s and 60s, but now the loans is increased substantially. So all these factors have been resulting to the resistance in development efforts. Uh, coming to trading, Around 60% of Nepal's trade is still with India, 10% around 10 with China and remaining with others. The majority of trades uh, is still comprised of base consuming goods like food, clothes, fuels, uh, technologies from simple to complex. Uh, there's always uh, huge deficit between import and export. Uh, and India has always been benefiting the trading between two countries. And this was also explicitly visible during both the blockades. Thus, Nepal now has shifted its priority also to China, Nepal border, and has also joined BRI. Um, so need for Nepal's, why, why is there need for UDI in Nepal? Nepal's economy is quite dependent on UDI provided by all these great powers and the multi, uh, multilateral institutions. Uh, UDI makes up about 24% of the national budget now and 60% of the development budget. 
but it has not been utilized properly. And in recent year, it has only been spent 44%. Uh, Nepal's political instability, massive corruption, and accountability have been pointed out often to be major constraints to uh, that hinders the mobilization of the foreign aid. Uh, but also it has been pointed out by many scholars and researchers that Nepal's instability is in the interest of great powers. Nevertheless, for Nepal to be more self-reliant, to move from the least developed country to a mid-income country, it needs to double its ODA in coming decade. Thus, priority should check the fragmentation of ODA, the random shifting of priorities. It should also reduce own corruption level and instability to attract more. Um, <clears throat> so after 1970, ODA given by great powers was made conditional behind uh, the veil of good governance and structural adjustment policies. The objectives were to carry out market-oriented neoliberal policies that would promote their own economy and their own long-term political interest. The ODA has become the basis for the emergence and diffusion of neoliberal ideas across the world, which then leads to the burgeoning of private markets, to inequitable access to resources in developing countries like ours, which can severely impact the economy in the long run. Uh, thus, the neoliberal model used by U.S. and its great power allies as means to restore its hegemony. That would be all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Priti. Um, could we uh, go with Mr. Gaurav Bhattarai next, please? Uh, sure. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mm. So let me, I hope uh, I'm audible. Uh, you are, yes. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, let me begin with uh, dragging one a recent example uh, where our uh, incumbent foreign minister stated that Nepal is still at the crossroad. So I'd like to go two weeks back when uh, there was a lunch mm, organized by Association of former uh, Korea diplomats and our incumbent foreign minister. Um, actually, I must say that uh, academician turned uh, foreign minister. Uh, you know, he stated that uh, Nepal is still at the crossroad. And to my surprise, like, you know, so when will Nepal like uh, abandon this crossroads and come into or enter into a highways or something like that? So because. We have been writing, we have been, you know, reiterating, and we, we have been telling to the world that Nepal drafted this constitution, new constitution. We have new hopes, we have new aspirations, and we need to, you know, look into the world through a new lens. But uh, when we hear our one foreign minister making such a statement, that really surprised uh, us mm -hmm. because it's not a new term. I should say it's something like uh, T. N. Madan says, you know, it's something like. Uh, uh, something like, uh, I should say, mm, necrophilic in nature. You know, you always love to crawl back to uh, those historians, those theorists who are no more in existence. And I, I, I got an opportunity to go to like listen to the previous sp speakers when they were trying to answer the questions in South Asian regionalism. And in this session as well, I find that, you know, a few terminologies, uh, it's like, it's, it's in our head always, like it's really, you know, agreeing once again with Tian Madan, like it's something like necrophilic in nature. Why we have not been able to abandon these terms, you know, geopolitics and geopolitics and geopolitics and small states and small states and small states and major powers. And, and all these I think are when we will come out of this hangover of this colonial constructs, you know, because that, 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 
they're largely the part of the colonial construct whenever we talk about these concepts. So I think the first, starting with this one, uh, actually I'm not supposed to like start with uh, this one uh, because my topic speak uh, something about like accommodating the interest of the major powers and what are the challenges and opportunities that Nepal uh, has at present, whether Nepal has some kind of opportunities from the major powers and what are the challenges that Nepal face at the moment. So I'm going to deliver on this. And, but before that, I'd like to you know, throw light on this uh, T.N. Madan's idea of uh, how like Nepali, there is the absence of already like uh, international relations in Nepal itself is a, you know, uh, uh, it's like something still in nascent phase, uh, totaling in nature. And, but, but, but the golf graph and the chit chat that we have, I found it very happy in nature sometimes because uh, the way we, 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 we drag Sempa, the way we drag Kaplan, the way we drag um, the Mersheimer, really interesting. But, uh, but, but it's something like reinventing the wheel again. Reinventing the wheel again. And uh, owing to this fact, uh, when we try to look into the nature of Nepal's foreign policy behavior, I think uh, uh, I find different approaches to look into it. Uh, historically, you can go back to uh, a kind of approach that, that tells you about something more about like uh, Nepal's institution, even before, even at the time when there was the British colonialism in the region, how Nepal came up with this one kind of indigenous approach to understand the, uh, you know, uh, international relations. I mean, the then international relations, Prithvi Narayan Sa, Dibya Upadesh is a worldview that Nepal had. Uh, but we know more it is that in the university and we know more discuss about it. I'm really surprised to see that. And secondly, after 1950, the previous speaker clearly mentioned that because we love 1950, you know, we love 1950. 1950 is a departure point for everyone, whether it's for political science, whether it's for sociology, anthropology. I'm really surprised to see this, that why we are so much in, you know, love with this 1950 because of the political change that we had or we didn't have any kinds of kinds of institution before that. So talking about Nepal's I mean, uh, uh, diplomatic behavior after 1950, yes, of course, it fundamentally changed uh, Nepal institutions, Nepal's foreign policy behavior in the region, outside of the region. And it's after 1950, Nepal joined the Committee of Nations. That's true. But what about the major powers uh, uh, that really had uh, their influence in the region? Yes, of course, the influence that you know, major powers had in the Nepal, it, it was the, the the influence was quite conflicting in nature. With, 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 with no doubt, I can say, tell that the interest is always conflicting in nature. And because of the conflicting nature of the major powers, uh, Nepal faces a kind of geopolitical uh, you know, difficulties in addressing or accommodating the interest of the major powers. It's there. One is like conflicting interest. And second is what we see is um, uh, in today's uh, world, when we're talking about interdependence, reciprocity, or something more than that, and uh, suddenly you have this COVID-19 as a kind of you know, non-conventional security threat, and uh, people were writing like how COVID-19 uh, is a kind of a last nail on the coffin of globalization. So suddenly we, you come out of a, you know, this kind of difficulties or the uncertainties that, that you have been shrouded, and what you feel right now is that uh, the rise of China, or let's say a new Cold War. Once, once again, I go back to Tian Madan and tell that this, this, the new Cold War hangover is the, another necrophilia. I feel so because you know you need a kind, some kind of terminologies to describe them, and you drag those terminologies, put them into theories, do the theoretical dance, and you come up with some kind of uh, you know once again a new necrophilia. So I think unless and until you come out of this necrophilic uh, kind of design. You know, it's really difficult, whether for a small countries, you say, or whether for like powerful countries, you say, to act policies into practices, because you already have the policies. I was really surprised to hear the foreign minister saying that you already had the policies that Nepal came out with a new, you know, foreign policy in 2020. And it was seen as a kind of integrated document, but we don't pay any kind of heat to exercise that. Rather, we pay more attention in you know, making some kind of statements that were part of a kind of long protracted transition we had in the past. So let me throw a little bit light on Nepal's foreign policy 2020. Then we'll try, and then I'll just like briefly list down the opportunities and the challenges that Nepal has uh, while trying to accommodate the interest of major powers. So 
in 2020, it was realized that Nepal should come up with a kind of, uh, no, realization was quite, quite long back, but Nepal you know, ultimately came up with a new foreign policy in 2020. And you know, if we try to look into, uh, we shouldn't forget that along with the political transformation uh, after the adaptation of the new constitution in 2015, uh, Nepal is anticipated to graduating from a kind of group of least developed countries in the next few years and expecting to become a kind of middle income countries by 2030. So this kind of uh, you know brand new confidence Nepal is looking to play its equal role in uh, international and regional area. Uh, of course, to fulfill its national interest as well as to contribute to the you know, international agenda more effectively. And in recent times, uh, what we see is that Nepal's strategic importance has also increased. And it's because, chiefly because of its location between India and China. And, uh, but the geostrategic importance, not only in by its opportunities, but also challenges. And because, because what we see is that uh, foreign policy has both permanent and changeable features. Because national interests are permanent, it is said that, and the foreign policy could be uh, different based on the you know, domestic and external environment. And with same realization, the past foreign policy 2020, I mean, the publication of, uh, of its kind for the first time, uh, recognizes this, uh, I think, as, as it presents a kind of an integrated uh, or let's say independent and balanced foreign policy with a national capability or uh, here, I would like to draw, you know, what exactly when we try to define foreign policy as a set of goals or priorities or strategies them, that, that is aimed at, you know, promoting one's national interest through the effective conduct of foreign relations or external relations. And Frederick Hatman or let's say George Modelsky, both of them like agree with this understanding. And upon the same understanding, I think Nepal's foreign policy 2020 also, uh, it came at the time of the strategic uh, realm of, you know, competing major powers in the region. And even more closure uh, at our doorway, it is said that. So hence, uh, it is believed that Nepal's foreign policy aims to define its, uh, you know, political or let's say diplomatic and economic posture in the in the in the change geopolitical, regional, and global setting. So, uh, of course, like at the same time, concurrently frames the existential primacy of a non-aligned or non-aligned policy. But most importantly, through the foreign policy 2020. Uh, Nepal has also attempted to effectively, you know, address its approach to multilateral, I mean, um, uh, international affairs, uh, safeguarding its uh, national interest while addressing the mutual interest of the major powers. Because what I would like to uh, mention here is that. Uh, so Mr. Patabai, part, oh, sorry to yes. interrupt, but I think we just have another minute left and that's pushing it all. Ah, that's fine. Okay. I'll just like conclude, no problem. Uh, you know, uh, just what I'm trying to tell you is that despite having uh, geopolitically located between like uh, uh, in the Himalayan region or let's say between India and China, uh, Nepal was not much known to the English speaking world uh, until 1990 people's moment and Western world knew you know, more about Nepal after the rural massacre or let's say Mao's insurgency or even after that peace process. So, you know, however, the status of the Himalayan state has been concealed not only by, you know, uh, free Tibet campaign, but more by the, you know, kind of today what we see uh, China-India rivalry. So that has largely like, uh, you know, um, um, uh, downsized a kind of geostrategic importance of Nepal. So lastly, I think opportunities and challenges are, of course, like in terms of opportunities, it, it seems to strengthen Nepal's geostrategic value, or it seems to uh, you know, provide a kind of opportunity to diversify its relation. And of course, for the regime protection also, it, it, it seems to be quite helpful, like your geostrategic position. And as its challenges, of course, managing, you know, conflicting interest and a kind of maintaining equidistance relations. And uh, it, 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 it challenges the practices and policies or, or like diverse, uh, diverse between practices and policies. So with this note, I think I'd like to conclude uh, uh, there are, of course, like opportunities and challenges, and I think Nepal can deal with this, both of them with, uh, you know, homegrown, you know, uh, IR, Nepali IR that is largely missing at the prison because we are, that is, it is much more driven by the dominant idea and temperance. That's what I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bhattarai, for the very feisty speech as well. Uh, uh, we'll discuss it in time. Uh, can we uh, st go with uh, Mr. Hari Prakash Chand, please? Uh, okay, am I audible? Uh, Aaron, I'm, am I audible? Yes, 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 you are. Please go ahead. Sir. Uh, okay, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm trying to share my uh, slide, first of all. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, respected chair, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, audiences, and all the participants who are watching uh, this live streaming through a various medium. Uh, this paper is uh, totally based on my uh, synthesis paper, uh, research paper, uh, which is uh, based on my PhD uh, synthesis paper and also has published in uh, Nepal's uh, um, journal uh, published by um, Policy Research Institute. And today I'm not going to explain in detail, but I'm only going to explain few theoretical and empirical findings and ana analysis. This is my outline, introduction, research statement, methodology, theoretical findings, empirical findings, analysis, a uh, brief review on Nepal's foreign policy, uh, a similarly brief review on uh, uh, foreign policy, 2077 years, that is 2020, and lapses on Nepal's foreign policy, 2020, and lastly, conclusion. Uh, I'm very much happy and feeling honored to present my paper on role of great power, play and geopolitics in shaping and reshaping Nepal's current policy in this session today. Uh, my presentation is focused mainly on the engagement of great powers in Nepal, the changes that are taking place due to it in Nepali geopolitics, and uh, their impact having on Nepal's current policy. Uh, the main argument of my paper is that Nepal has undergone many geopolitical changes in the last 70 years, uh, faced many crises, but has not been able to change uh, its current policy accordingly. Uh, without any delay, I would like to highlight the following, uh, the, the few points as the summary of the theoretical findings of my research, which are based on the theory of geopolitics and uh, the theory of heartland. The number one is geographical settings and political process, which is known as the geopolitics are dynamic and hence geopolitics is also dynamic. And number second is, uh, if geopolitical uh, geopolitics is dynamic, foreign policy never can be static. If it remains unchanged, geopolitical crisis emerges, and foreign Arizu, policy. We can't becomes, see your screen. Uh, sorry, sorry. We can't see your screen. Yes. Uh, screen. I I have shared my uh, my my slide. Can you please click on the slide one? I think uh, here is some technical problem, sir. Uh, I have displayed, I have shared my slide. Okay, carry on. Okay. Uh, the, the third point of my uh, theoretical findings is there is a theory proposed and advanced by Halford John McEnder in 1904, which is called theory of heartland. The heartland theory was theorized as part of geopolitics. Uh, number four is okay, there are three physical characteristics of the heartland. Uh, one is it is relates with grassland zone of the heartland. Number two is it includes the lowland plain on the face of globe. And number three is some great plain uh, uh, navigable, navigable rivers. Uh, I, I have also highlighted three non physical characteristics. Number one is physical characteristics, and number two is uh, non physical characteristics, which are related to. Uh, theory of heartland. Non-physical characteristics are number one, geographical significance, number two, territorial significance, and number three is strategic significance. Uh, I have also listed out few empirical findings. These uh, which I, which, uh, I have uh, explained earlier are the theoretical findings. Now I'm moving uh, towards the empirical findings. Uh, the number one is South Asian geopolitics is becoming a new heartland in the 21st century due to the rise of China and the 21st century US encirclement policy. Uh, the number second is South Asian geography and geopolitics carries the three physical and non-physical characteristics of Mackinder's heartland. Uh, similarly, number third is as the great powers are focusing in Nepal, Nepal's geopolitics has also been changed significantly in recent times especially in the post-Nepal constitution period. Uh, still, the BRI uh, pro projects are pending despite having no legal obstacle, but ironically, uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation Compact project is under implementation, even in the context of having serious legal issues in the parliament of Nepal. 
Uh, number five is these are these two projects and the massive investment of major powers have seriously implicated the Nepal foreign policy. Uh, therefore, Nepal is unable to take any decision on the MCC and to proceed with the RI. This is a serious crisis in Nepal's foreign policy. Uh, these, uh, these things are related to the theoretical findings and empirical findings of my research paper. Now, I would like to highlight a few points uh, as the analysis of my paper. Uh, the analysis is comprised of theoretical and empirical analysis combined early with uh, theoretical and empirical analysis. Number one, geopolitics is not stable, stable in international system. Uh, if we uh, study the history of international affairs or world affairs, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, get that geopolitics is static, but it is dynamic. It is changing in nature itself. The discourse of Asian century is the result of geopolitical shift. Uh, next is geopolitics is not an independent phenomenon. It, is has, it has a dual relationship with mainstream theories of international relations like realism, liberalism, and constructive, constructivism. If realist activities, if liberal activities, and if, if constructive, cons, uh, constructivist activities are emerged, then automatically geopolitics is also changed accordingly. Uh, the geopolitics of the great powers always dominates the geopolitics of the weak and small powers. Therefore, the geopolitics of weaker states cannot remain separate and independent from the geopolitics of great powers. Uh, next point is geopolitics is the key determinant of foreign policy. Uh, we, know, we know very well that there are uh, so many points uh, related to the determinant of foreign policy. However, the geopolitics is the key determinant in my, uh, based on my research. When geopolitics changes, foreign policy should also be revisited. If the foreign policy remains the same, even in the changed geopolitics, uh, political crisis evolves and a vacuum is created. Our next point is Nepal has encountered several shifts in her uh, geopolitics, but she never significantly and comprehensively revisited her foreign policy, except Nepal's current policy uh, 2020 years. Uh, previous speaker, my friend Gaurav Bhattar has well uh, uh, explained about the Nepal's foreign policy 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, while talking about major power play in Nepal and her geopolitics, assessing Nepal's foreign policy is a very crucial uh, factor. Therefore, I have briefly assessed Nepal's foreign policy. According to uh, Nepal Nepalese constitution 2015, uh, there are five major pillars of Nepal's foreign policy. These are pillar one, Charter of the United Nations. Which, has, uh, which was evolved on 24 October 2000, uh, 1945, sorry, 24 October 1945. Pillar two, non-alignment movement of 1955. Pillar third, principle of Panchasil, which is also called as five principle of peaceful coexistence, evolved in 1954. Uh, pillar four, international law. Uh, it's modern history dates back to the 15th and 16th century. And, and Mr. Harichand, I'm yes? sorry to interrupt, sir, but I think uh, you're about time already. Oh, okay, okay. I, I am going to. I am going to back during the discussions, please. Yeah. Okay, okay. I will. I will uh, discuss during the question and answer, uh, question and answer session. All right. And, All right. Uh, okay. I conclude. In conclusion, uh, Nepal should form a team of experts to conduct vigorous research on the great power play and geopolitics of the 21st century. Uh, since power struggles and geopolitical shifts automatically affect foreign policy, foreign policy should be reshaped in aligning with these two things. Otherwise, traditional foreign policy becomes unable to address the new dimensions of threats, risks, and challenges. And finally, to cope up with the effect of major powers, Nepal should develop and apply the soft power and constructivist approach on adapting relevant foreign policy uh, in Nepal, as we could not afford a realist and liberalist approach in the foreign policy of Nepal. Thank you uh, for uh, giving this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Harichand. Dr. Sauravi Gimire, please. Yeah, hello, am I audible? You are, yes. Okay, please let go me ahead, start Can you see me? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, I great. I think the uh, screen that was shared by Mr. Harichand, uh, that may be an issue to promote. Would you have would like to have a look at it? But you are visible, Saravi. You can go ahead. Okay. Can okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, 
I would like to thank Mr. Pramod Jaiswal for giving me the opportunity to speak in this conference. And uh, my topic is uh, US engagement in Nepal. So basically, uh, I'll start my presentation with a little bit of uh, background on US uh, foreign policy interest in South Asia and how uh, Nepal uh, comes into play in that dynamic. Uh, and also, I will uh, touch on some points uh, that's related to some uh, divergences between the US and Nepal. And then on, I'll conclude the presentation. So um, extending bilateral and multilateral engagement in South Asia is of utmost importance to US. And there are several factors which makes South Asia a priority in the US foreign policy. Such factors are threat to stability emerging from the region the overall strategic significance of South Asia and various uh, geopolitical shifts. The shifts are the withdrawal from Afghanistan and accelerating American focus in the Indo-Pak region, threats from global terrorist networks and strategic maneuvering vis-a-vis -vis China. Treating South Asia as a singular unit has been always uh, difficult to US uh, because of its complexity of various political and economic situation. It has a strong ongoing relationship with India and wants it to play a critical role in its Indo-Pak policy because India is useful uh, uh, in uh, countering China and also in blustering uh, the Quad. In Afghanistan, the withdrawal of US has ended the two decades of unfruitful pursuit. While with Pakistan, there has been a downgrade of bilateral relations and Washington does not see going back to the hyphenated era of Indo-Pak, uh, which is mainly due to its continuous failure in brokering the peace in the country and uh, the support of Taliban. The withdrawal from Afghanistan has, uh, however, allowed the US to focus more on its Indo-Pacific strategy, and a huge chunk of it is to counter uh, China's deepening footprint uh, across the region fueled by its uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Hence, uh, the attention of the US in South Asia is largely framed through the lens of rivalry with China. In this context, uh, Nepal comes into the picture firstly because of its strategic location between India and China. The US views the importance of Nepal in striking the balance between, uh, sorry, against uh, Chinese aspirations. This is the current context of larger geopolitical scenario. However, the US and Nepal have cordial relations since 1947 when diplomatic relations were established. And since 1951, the US has provided Nepal with economic aid. On the other hand, Nepal has also evolved into an emerging democracy with growing economic opportunity. And US has contributed uh, till now, I think close to $1.6 billion in aid and assistance. U.S. has engaged with Nepali diaspora leaders and diplomats and has uh, funded in different sectors such as health education and military training. Broadly, uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy interests in Nepal consist of Nepal's independence and territorial integrity, assistance for democratic process, uh, conflict uh, mitigation, economic uh, recovery, and improving human rights situation. Agencies like the USAID have funded uh, these uh, programs and has focused on restoring democracy, economic liberalization, prevention of terror, and uh, etc. So there are about three lakh people of uh, Nepali uh, heritage in the US, and Nepal also emphasizes on people-to-people -people ties. So overall, we see a cordial relationship between the two countries, but in the current uh, landscape in uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy, strategy of US and unfolding of the new emergent powers in the region, Nepal is very crucial geopolitically. Indeed, uh, the US wants to include uh, Nepal in its defense strategy revealed by the US De uh, Department of Defense, uh, which published the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report in 2019. And uh, this partnership includes uh, peacekeeping operations, uh, defense professionalization, ground force capacity, and counterterrorism. Uh, however, the U.S. is very uh, apprehensive of Biara and has urged Nepal to even consider the transparency and sustainability of Chinese investments in Nepal and has uh, cautioned subtly uh, about falling into a Chinese debt trap. Uh, but to make a point here, like uh, every aid and assistance from big powers uh, comes with a strategic 
interest and uh, U US is not any different uh, from that. Uh, in the area of divergences, uh, Nepal and US have some difficult spots uh, on the Tibet matter. And uh, the US has a renewed interest on Tibet and has passed several acts like supporting Tibetans to choose their spiritual successor and has allocated funds for Tibetans living in various countries. Um, uh, China obviously wants uh, Nepal support uh, and uh, wants to hand over, wants Nepal to hand over the uh, Tibetan refugees. And uh, the fear in US is that Nepal will succumb to the Chinese pressure. Uh, however, Nepal initially did sideline the extradition treaty with China, which came as a big uh, disappointment in Beijing. Uh, we can see that Nepal is becoming a playground of geopolitical competition between US and China over the issue of Tibet. With the BRI, which is a massive infrastructure project, uh, and US has also tried to do something similar uh, through its Millennium Corp uh, Challenge Corporation or the MCC, which is part of the now it is a part of Indo-Pacific strategy and uh, it aims at uh, reducing poverty and accelerate growth. Uh, since its creation in 2004, however, uh, MCC has helped 43 countries and uh, Nepal has signed the agreement in 2017, but is yet to ratify it. Its $500 million uh, grant uh, is aimed uh, at uh, two projects. Uh, most uh, First is the electricity transmission and secondly is uh, the upgrading of uh, transportation in Nepal. Uh, however, Be Beijing is discomforted uh, with the MCC grant and use it a uh, move to contain China. Um, okay, so I think I will just conclude here and uh, staying within the time limit. Uh, so here, uh, incorporation of MCC, which has raised a lot, lot of uh, controversy in Nepal, uh, depends on several factors about its perception of MCC, uh, if it is a part of the defense agreement. And it highly depends on the US to clarify such perception and ensure it's purely a infrastructural project and nothing else in order to help Nepal. And um, Obviously, US aid and assistance, when you talk about it, uh, it has ebbed and flowed uh, in the past. And uh, right now, we see a lot of uh, focus on Nepal uh, in the US. And uh, uh, its aid also has also depends on the political situation in the region. So uh, I would like to say that uh, the ball is in Nepal's court if it can successfully maneuver between the two opposing yet uh, indispensable powers. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Kimire, and thank you for keeping in time. Uh, Ms. Elvis, can I ask you to take the floor, please? Yes, good morning. <clears throat> so sorry. Uh, so thank you so much first for inviting me to express myself on the topic of uh, the involvement of French INGOs in Nepal. Uh, I will try my best to keep it short and sweet and uh, keep track of the time. Uh, I want first, actually, it's absolutely impossible to speak about the involvement of INGOs, French INGOs in Nepal without knowing a little bit more about the history and diplomatic history of France and Nepal. Uh, both countries actually celebrated um, their uh, 70 years of diplomatic relations in 2019. So we are now at 72 years of diplomatic relations between the two countries. Uh, so far, it has been fairly friendly. Uh, the very first true diplomatic exchanges uh, started in 1949, and uh, it started mostly with culture and research and investment protection rather than proper economic relations. As we know, uh, it took a little longer for that. The culture and research was mainly targeting mountaineering and, uh, and basic uh, sharing of uh, knowledge and culture on uh, mountaineering and other other related or other topics, um, economic relations between the two countries, like in terms of uh, being managed by the countries themselves, was actually started just uh, in the 80s. And uh, among other areas of cooperation, there's one that's uh, that's been quite important for the for the French embassy and for the the, the French diplomacy. That's actually the uh, cooperation around energy and around uh, seismology. So, 
um, the French Atomic Energy Commission and the French Department of en Environmental Monitoring Analysis. We signed an agreement with the Nepali Department of Mine and Geology in 1978, just two years after the Department of Mines and Geology was uh, created. So it's true that research and scientific research has always been kind of uh, at the core of the relations between France and Nepal. Um, and uh, so we saw that, for example, with the installation of all the first seismic sensor that were in, uh, managed by uh, through, this, uh, through this agreement between the two countries. Um, there is also, uh, I mean, as for every, every uh, Western country, the Indo-Pacific region is an, of utmost importance and it's one of the priority of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so because of that, there is a, a military presence in, in South Asia as well, though it's actually very minor compared to some other great powers. Uh, France, in its relationship with Nepal, uh, things have been evolving quite a bit. Uh, the embassy changed uh, a lot. And, uh, and so at the moment, actually, France relationship with Nepal goes a lot through the, the diplomacy between the European Union and Nepal rather than just bilateral uh, discussions and, and diplomatic relations. So because uh, French people have a very strange fascination. I'm, I'm speaking about the actual population of France, have a very, very odd fascination with uh, India and Nepal and South Asia in general. Uh, there, were, there are a lot of French people also who travel every year to India and Nepal. Uh, and uh, if we take just 2018, for example, there were over 32,000 tourists from France. Uh, so though it's the, the, the coronavirus kind of disturbed that a little bit, but really French people also have been coming to France for quite a while. And uh, so because of the, the diplomatic presence, the presence of the French population here, uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, not speak about the uh, involvement of association and INGOs in Nepal. So there are different layers to the to the INGOs in Nepal as I mean I'm, I will speak about the French example however it probably can be um, translated to a lot of other countries um, the French humanitarian presence in Nepal so first let's speak a little bit uh, about the institutional French involvement in Nepal in terms of development with the French development agency that is the uh, government agency for development so there are no offices in Nepal of the French Development Agency, but there is one in Delhi and one uh, in China, I mean, several, several agencies in China as well. And uh, actually a lot of projects in are, are taking place in Nepal through the agency of Delhi. Uh, so there is quite a bit of involvement of the French Development Agency, but they basically usually go through other organizations, uh, including French INGOs. So now speaking about the layers of INGOs, I think that translates a lot, uh, that take, talks a lot also about the complexity of the work of INGOs and the layering you can find in Nepal of those INGOs is that, uh, so you have the Social Welfare Council in Nepal that regulates uh, all INGOs and NGOs and uh, that uh, all INGOs are required to be um, registered with. However, when we look at the SWC uh, lists of INGOs, among the 230 INGOs, 10 only are French. Uh, we can compare that number to the UK number. There are 36, uh, uh, 36 UK INGOs in Nepal. And closer to France, we have 13 uh, German INGOs in Nepal. So this is speaking about the uh, uh, INGOs that are officially registered uh, to the Social Welfare Council and work through the lens of the Social Welfare Council and all the rules that, that are imposed through that. However, so this is the very first layer of INGOs, but there are a lot more involvement of INGOs and or uh, small uh, organizations from France in Nepal. So 
if you look at uh, if you look at, for example, the, the website of the French Embassy, you will have over twenty associations that will be uh, that will be registered there. However, not all of them have an office in Nepal, but most of them are actually working here. But then, actually, when you really go into detail, it's there are hundreds of. I'm I'm not even. Uh, joking, I'm not even making it uh, an exaggeration. There are hundreds of associations in France that have somehow an involvement in Nepal. So it goes from the big ones, so Action Against Hunger, ACTED, uh, Humanity and Inclusion, that are slightly bigger INGOs and that are all registered through the LCWC and have very, their offices in, in the country. And then you have a lot of associations that were actually developed through friendship and a lot of uh, grassroots uh, projects that have each of them an impact on the, develop the global development of, uh, of the country. Whether this, uh, this impact is positive or negative is, is fairly difficult to, to assess. However, there have been a lot of uh, evolution in the quality of the work that has been done by the associations. Uh, so let's, uh, I just want to speak briefly about what do those associations do? What interests, uh, like what's interesting to French INGOs in Nepal? So in, uh, in the prism of the, the, um, the rules of the SWC, there are some things that are completely compulsory, including uh, expenses in hardware and uh, hardware projects. So a lot of French INGOs have uh, changed uh, their, their path to build more houses or schools or uh, things like that, actually. So this is not something that was really done before, but clearly the earthquake of 2015 changed a lot of things and the hardware policy, hardware software policy of the SWC also changed a lot of things in that regard. And uh, the smaller association actually are mainly working on education, health, and uh, protection, uh, women protection and child protection. One of the debates that we can have uh, about the involvement of the small association is the, and bigger ones as well, is uh, actually uh, when to, when can it be considered to be a little too much of, uh, micromanaging uh, societies that are so far from our own culture. And so uh, one of the things that uh, French INGOs are trying to work on at the moment, it's to bring a little bit more uniformity to their work and, uh, and create more links between their work. And uh, so French INGOs, how many, uh, so there are over 500 associations in France working with Nepal. 10 officially registered and having an office in Nepal. Uh, but altogether, actually, what's be, what needs to be developed and what's lacking and has been lacking for quite a while now is proper coordination of efforts. But And uh, this has been kind of blown out of proportion with uh, the, the earthquake and the response to the earthquake. So uh, in conclusion, just very, very briefly, in conclusion, the Involvement of French INGOs in Nepal uh, changed a lot from the very beginning when it was really more uh, cultural and more um, uh, social work. And now it's shifting towards uh, a little more um, infrastructures development and things like that, giving way to uh, actually like letting the, the, the local NGOs taking, take over the big work on social work. That's it for me. Thank you, Alois. Um, we've received a few questions uh, from Facebook. So I think what we'll do is I'll just run through. We've got three of them. And if anyone wants to come in, uh, please feel free. Uh, so the first one is, uh, how do you assess Nepal's international relations amid the growing border disputes with China and India and the growing tensions between China and the United States on a host of global issues? This is from Sheila on Facebook. Um, anyone? May I start? 
Yes, please, oh, please, thank you. please, Mr. President. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. How do you look at the China and US competing in Nepal through their BRI and Indo-Pacific strategy? Uh, as uh, I have argued earlier during my presentation, uh, um, thought, uh, whether Nepal like or don't like uh, um, the great power interest, if they, that reflects in Nepal, of course they come and Nepal need to respond to them. And as you know that uh, Nepal has already vision for Poros Poros Nepal and Happy Nepali to materialize that long-term vision. Nepal need resources and there is resource gap and we, we need to fulfill. At the same time, uh, we have no, Nepal has not to compromise with its sovereignty as well. So the, so hedging, uh, hedging provides uh, flexibility in foreign policy options. Uh, Nepal can choose uh, uh, limited band bargaining based on issue, but at the same time, Nepal need to segregate uh, um, uh, uh, security element from economic uh, element because uh, in uh, uh, different kinds of overture or different kinds of initiative uh, uh, brought by uh, great powers, so whether it's, it is in form of BRI or Indo-Pacific or MCC, uh, we need to uh, separate smartly uh, uh, security element from the economic element and we need to respond because uh, we need to go ahead, we need to develop and so so that, that is my response indeed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, would anyone else want to take that question again? Okay, um, we'll move on to the next one, which is uh, how do you look at China and the US competing in Nepal through the BRI and Indo-Pacific strategy? I think Mr. Uh, Chandrika Pandit touched upon it, but if anyone wants to comment on the Belt and Road Initiative and how it's working out in, in Nepal just now. Mr. Bhattarai, would you want to? Uh, thank you. Mm, I think I'll, I'll start with the first one. There was some kind of first uh, question as well. Uh, yes. I saw that regarding the Himalayan, uh, Himalayan um, a kind of hern lock or something like that. That so was I, meant in, I'd uh, like to start with like, you know. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, earlier, like Himalayas, they were they were perceived in a really mystical manner, at least in a uh, Hima ancient period, the way like Himalayas were perceived. And but during the medieval period, uh, uh, Nepal started a kind of trans-Himalayan trade uh, up to Central Asia, and um, at least until the uh, British colonialism in South Asia uh, hadn't commenced. Uh, so until then, there was a kind of economic relations in the mountains. So. Uh, earlier, mountains were seen something like in a mystical manner than with the uh, trans himalayan trade, you try to economize the mountains. But once again, with the British colonialism in South Asia, what you see is that it has, it, it largely secretized the mountains. And the same kind of secretization is still in existence today also, whether uh, we, you know, we, we can see that or not. But uh, secretization in China's foreign policy towards Nepal or Securitization in India's foreign policy towards Nepal, it's quite visible. But what are the, you know, in the question, I could see that what are the, what, what, how could Nepal balance or how do you assess the balancing approach of Nepal in the first question? So I think uh, in paper and practice, these two are, th I think uh, if you look at look it from the four P's, four P's means like power, politics, practice, and policies. So I'll just try to use two P's here. One is the practice and another is uh, policies. And what we have in the policies that have not been really practiced, and that creates a kind of uh, difficulties or difficulty of maintaining neutral stance, difficulty of uh, you know exercising non-aligned position, difficulty of maintaining a kind of equidistance relations, difficulty of maintaining a kind of uh, equi proximity relations. So we have that in papers. So uh, although Nepal has all these things in papers, why we have time and again failed in practice is because going to probably, uh, you know, political transition or political uncertainties back home, firstly. And secondly, like most of the scholars, um, you know, uh, in a range from S.D. Muni to so far we find today is to protect your regime back home. So we find that as well. So I think it's a kind of diverse between, you know, um, um, kind of, you know, uh, divergence between what is in policy and what is being practiced. So that, that, that's how I assess this. Uh, balancing, uh, you know, approach of Nepal when it comes to uh, India-China or China-United States. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Bhattarai. I, I think that was a very interesting element that you just threw into the conversation. Um, uh, I'm wondering when you talk about uh, these uh, these narratives that are generally woven around and then they're, impl they're forced upon countries that are looked at as being buffer states or smaller states um, is entirely wrong, like you said, but I'm wondering how much of strategic autonomy is actually possible when there are economic compulsions, when there are geographical limitations. Not, not to say that they cannot be done. I'm just thinking of what are the options that you may have without suffering greater losses. Uh, there are very unfortunate instances of blockades which uh, countries have used, right? So I, I'm thinking, can you come up with anything that uh, you think can probably be used as leverage? Uh, it, it cannot be the power sector anymore, but anything that uh, perhaps you, Mr. Bhattarai, or any of the other scholars can think of? Uh, thank you. Just like... Uh... Earlier also, we had this question on BRI and in the passive strategy or AUKUS. You know, uh, Nepal's political parties, they have already made a consensus that Nepal will never enter into a debt trap because almost all the political parties, they have already entered into a consensus that uh, we are not going to, you know, uh, entertain a Chinese railway if it comes with some kind of debt. So that makes it quite clear that uh, Nepal will escape the debt trap uh, as there is already a national consensus over that. So I think BRI issue should not be uh, seen in antagonistic as an antagonistic to uh, Indo-Pacific strategy as well, because what Nepal believes is that both of them are a kind of partnership for peace. And regarding the terminologies that, 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 that you call for like whether small states or neutrality or you know, non-alignment. So I think these, these are the, you know, a safe heaven for small countries, like you know, this this uh, at least on papers they use this in paper and be you know be on the safe side. So whenever there is a, like they want justification, you know, last time in 2017, German ambassadors, uh, German ambassador, I forget his name right now, he was uh, in our department and he he asked to my students that you know, so what's Nepal's position on uh, Iraq and uh, North Korea? So everyone was largely silent, you know. So at least we have in the papers there is the presence of neutrality and non-alignment. So whenever like such issue pops up, so we have the in the papers, but in practice, what we see is that when there was like 20 Indian soldiers were killed uh, in the in 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 Galwan, like you know, uh, uh, our two immediate neighbors, two immediate nuclear powers, I must say, fighting with the stones, and that was like nuclear stones or something like that. So, you know, they're fighting with the stones and 20, uh, you know, Indian soldiers died, unfortunately. And what we did is that, you know, Communist Party of Nepal had a kind of virtual meeting with the Communist Party of China. And we say that it coincided with the Galwan crisis. So that's how our, we exercise our foreign policy. And that is too, you know, as I mentioned earlier, is like a divergence from the policies. And it is a kind of really, you know, policies and practices that they are completely you know, different uh, in, in, in Nepali context. So I think unless and until we exercise our Nepali IR, so going back to TN Madan once again, Indian uh, anthropologist, uh, because I've been reading him time and again this day, so probably he comes to my mind time and again. Mm, you know, it's like something like, let's come out of the graves, you know, let's, let's forget lobbing these dead bodies anymore. And let's implement something indigenous that, that is more practical, that is much more reliable. How long will carry this hangover of geopolitics and everything like starting from theory, you know? So I think it's, it's, it's better to be more practical and to introduce a kind of homegrown uh, Nepali IR, what is more suitable pragmatically to us. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Ms. Supriti, would you want to make any comments on, uh, say, the resonance that uh, organizations, multilateral organizations like the SARC may still have? And if we think about a country like Nepal trying to change the agenda or inducing something into the agenda, what that agenda could look like? Um, uh, sure. Thank you. Well, Nepal would all, has always wanted to come out of the quandary it has been through since 1950s. And with, uh, so Gauravji calls it hangover. I would still want to call it toxic relationship. So we've, we've tried much, we've um, come, out, come out with many solutions, but have they been ex exercised? No. Uh, so how long and how far? And I would again want to uh, 
I mentioned uh, Gaurav-ji. He said uh, for, for countries like Nepal, which has become joke, in geopolitical power play, BRI could be uh, could be uh, ex, you know, it could be of some hope. Um, that that is all I would want to say. And uh, again, uh, looking at our model of economy, what we. We, I think it's also now time for us to take take a stance on a, a model of our economy, you know, and to just ally and not just stand for the non-alignment independent foreign policy, but ally with some um, some great powers so we could we could uh, come out of the toxic relationship and quandary you know like balancing is surely not working out it's not thank yes, you that, is, that, that would be all thank you uh, 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 thank you uh, I, I would argue though that there is this leeway that something like non-alignment and hedging gives you where you choose uh, sides depending on uh, what is of interest uh, to the country at the moment um, maybe Nepal uh, is learning uh, with every passing episode uh, to get better at it. Um, Mr. Uh, Hari Chand, would you like to come in, sir? Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, would you once again repeat the question? No, we were just talking about, uh, uh, Mr. Prithi was making the point that uh, it may be time to choose sides sometimes to align with uh, some power instead of, uh, because the balancing uh, she's arguing is not working as well. Or, or any of the other points, if you would like to make a comment on any of the other points as well. Okay, okay, okay. thank you so much. Uh, uh, regarding the uh, uh, notion of balance, I, I think in my opinion, this is, not, this is not the era of balance. This is not the era of equity uh, we have uh, We have moved forward beyond the era of balance and era of equity proximity. We are in 20, uh, we are in the new, new, new century, that is uh, 2021. We are. I'm sorry, sir, you, uh, you're not audible anymore. Mr. Harichand? I think we lost him, did we? Uh, does anyone else want to make any uh, comments on uh, Dr. Kimiri, would you want to uh, come in on um, perhaps the, sorry, go ahead, sir, please, you know, sorry. Like what uh, you just mentioned, like, uh, I, I just, just thank you, thank you very much. Like, uh, you know, taking sides, um, I not exactly agree, but uh, can Nepal, uh, countries like uh, Nepal or like, uh, they can are they, are they in a position to afford it? It's really you know dangerous to take sides sometimes because when normally uh, things come up, uh, you know the discussions are underway to take sides. Usually when India and China are in bad relations, because in 2020 also like Southeastern countries were almost like obliged to take sides. Uh, you know so once again like I think uh, the policy that you have adopted and the practices that you are that that that, that you have implemented, I think they make the larger differences because. In the in policies, you have already like uh, countries like Nepal. So we are in a conference. We can we can tell that yes, uh, it's better to take sides. But what if we try to look into the policies that have been crafted by the government? So what we see because if we try to analyze the policy, then of course like I I, I probably like uh, you know uh, what, if if you look at the policy like what we see is that the policy of neutrality, non-alignment, and even we even the new foreign policy. I mean the Nepal's not exactly new like integrated foreign policy. Earlier, there was just the high level recommendations and they have been like compiled into one and they have been introduced as an integrated autonomous and auto, you know, independent foreign policy of Nepal in 2020. So this foreign policy talks about the relevancy of non-aligned movement. Although non-aligned movement is a Cold War strategy. Probably when India is multi-aligned and China is retaliating on the, you know, peaceful coexistence under the BRI, uh, whether, whether like non-aligned movement for Nepal is relevant or not, that is another question. That is another question. Non-alignment moment is really relevant for Nepal when like India is multi-aligned and China is reiterating on the peaceful coexistence under the BRI framework. That's the one question. But what we see in the policy is that, you know, 
Nepal's integrated 2020 policy it clearly hints at the importance of neutrality, non-alignment, equity stance, and as such. So are we in a position to change that policies and frame a new one as per the requirement or not? And if yes, then is Nepal uh, you know, uh, in a position to pay for the damage done? This is the, another one. No, because uh, I don't think Nepal will is in a safe side to take um, any 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 sides. Uh, just just a reflection. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes. yes, I would uh, I would like to agree with the Gauravji again. We are not currently in position at all to um, take sides. Uh, we are very much indebted to our uh, sharing of borders with. India, uh, because the trading is mostly through uh, through that, and maybe BRI could be uh, one of the possible uh, out outlook for the alternative way for um, new trading systems. Uh, regarding great powers, uh, again, we are not in the position to take sides because we've. Uh, already been um, taken over very deeply structurally um, uh, say it's may it be economics may it be politics cultural education we've been uh, we've been exposed to uh, exposed to a lot a lot of uh, ideas. Uh, and we can't just uh, now uh, be hung on to one set of ideas and take take sides. But eventually, eventually, in coming years, in a decade or two, if Nepal could uh, could transform its uh, trade uh, trading system, uh, not just being dependent on India, but uh, uh, but across across the globe, and the hope is only BRI. Uh, so after that, maybe it could uh, it could attain some uh, stability in other ideologies too, not just uh, not just the ideas that has been imposed on us and um, thrown us thrown on us because uh, we're, we're being the victim of geopolitical uh, polarity and geopolitical tensions. Thank you, Mr. Prithi. Uh, there's a question on Facebook. Um, at the time when Nepal has failed to look beyond India and China, how can we benefit from Nepal's engagement with Europe and Japan and the US and other major powers? Uh, Dr. Gimire, would you want to come in on that, ma'am? Uh, yeah, sure, ma'am. I think uh, uh, more than that, like the previous uh, question on like uh, taking sides, I think uh, we are entering into an era with, uh, you know, there are mu multipolar uh, powers and uh, even US don't talk about allies anymore, like how it was in the Cold War, because we see a lot of uh, new powers emerging in like uh, different uh, parts of the world. Uh, so in that sense, <clears throat> I think Nepal uh, as a country, first of all, it has to look inwards domestically to come out of its uh, uh, economic uh, problems and issues. I think dealing uh, that internally and uh, avoiding uh, dependence on aids and uh, foreign funding will uh, go a long way in uh, developing your own set of foreign policies. And uh, yeah, so because uh, taking sides, uh, uh, because we are not sure, like, you know, what's going to happen in China, there can be a, uh, a major economic meltdown uh, in, the, uh, in the new future in China as well. So we don't know what the future holds. So uh, the question of taking sides uh, seems a bit uh, uh, obsolete uh, in the current context. And uh, uh, okay, so for the uh, second question, I think, uh, uh, Nepal should have relations with uh, great powers and uh, uh, the regional powers as well. I don't know much about on uh, the European powers, uh, uh, but uh, 
having a good uh, bilateral relations uh, with the developed countries uh, is always good. Uh, keeping them on, on a good uh, friendly terms, uh, it always helps. And uh, when it comes to US, um, Nepal has a very uh, difficult position uh, to deal with at the moment. Uh, given the entire focus of US foreign policy in the Indo-Pacific and uh, uh, the ways to contain China, especially with the uh, formation of AUKUS uh, with Australia and UK, uh, it is a very strong uh, strategic uh, partnership compared to even Quad because um, Australia, like uh, 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 nuclear submarines, uh, are uh, been, are on like uh, process of being built, uh, which uh, through the US uh, technology and US had not done that in the last fifty years. So uh, depending on uh, what uh, uh, strategic uh, position uh, China and US take, I think uh, Nepal has to be very vigilant about that and uh, take decisions uh, on its foreign policy uh, uh, priority. Would you want to make any comments on the uh, imminent uh, uh, tensions that are expected to flare up with the succession issue in uh, Tibet? Because I would imagine uh, Nepal also forms an important part of the U.S.'s calculus for the uh, region. Uh, you know, when they're talking about Nepal, they consider the proximity to Tibet as well. So uh, is there any uh, conversation within Nepal that you would want to share? Uh, how, how does Nepal view the issue? Whether they think... I think uh, uh, Nepal... Uh, I think... Uh, I think in the heart, Nepal wants to support the Tibetan issues because uh, there has been very close uh, cultural and religious links between uh, the uh, Buddhist and uh, the Dalai Lama and Nepal overall. Uh, but when it comes to uh, politics and uh, the strategic stance of uh, China, uh, I think uh, uh, US also feels that, that you know, uh, Nepal might succumb to the Chinese pressure. And I think that was kind of manifested when uh, the extradition treaty uh, that uh, Nepal was supposed to sign with China uh, uh, according to which uh, the uh, Nepal was supposed to hand over the Tibetan refugees. Uh, initially, that was sidelined and that came as a big shock to uh, the Chinese. Uh, but uh, I don't know much about it, but uh, in, in the news, uh, there were like some secret uh, uh, signing of the extradition treaty between Nepal and China. So yeah, that will create a major uh, uh, bilateral issues uh, between US and Nepal. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Elvois, um, uh, any, when uh, you find a country like Nepal at, uh, I don't want to say crossroads, and up said Mr. Bhattara again, but a different kind of crossroads, uh, um, do you find uh, it either easy or more difficult for funding to come through when there are so many international actors at play uh, for the work that, uh, the kind of work that you do with your organization or were doing? Sure. So actually, the thing is that there is a global crisis of funding for INGOs in any case. So Nepal is definitely, sadly, not more, no, not any more priority. So okay. uh, fundings, and especially like there are some conditions that are put to fundings that are not necessarily compatible with uh, Nepalese policy uh, towards like the fundings that are allowed to come in Nepal. In the sense, like uh, we have we have control over the expenses, which completely makes sense. I'm not as, uh, but some of those expenses uh, feel like politically controlled rather than being actually looked at into uh, like in the perspective of the, the, the benefits that it bring. I, I do agree that there is, uh, I mean, the number of uh, INGO per capita in Nepal is just uh, insane. It it's, doesn't make any sense for a country like Nepal to have so many NGOs and INGOs that don't necessarily coordinate that well. So all these things and the, the fact that the, the geographical situation of Nepal makes it not so attractive to funds, like if, if I had to be absolutely completely honest about it. And especially in, in the perspective, so in the, in the organization that I, I was uh, working for, we were mainly working on human rights, human trafficking, uh, protection of women and children, access to education, and so on and so on. These kind of things are not necessarily the priority anymore. 
because of uh, the, 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 the priority being on the development of infrastructure that would bring to a potential funding agency more influence in the region. So uh, this, this has been a shift that has been observed. And uh, if I can just speak very, very briefly about the relationship with, uh, between Nepal and European Union, it's, it's very interesting uh, to see actually the development of this specific relation. Uh, the 13th joint meeting uh, of uh, Nepal and European Union actually happened just a few days ago. Uh, it was on 24th of November in Kathmandu. And the European, it's, they redefine kind of uh, what is the current state of the relationship between the two, uh, the two, the country, the, the, uh, between Nepal and the European Union. And um, it's been interesting to actually see how the European Union is putting forward uh, things like human rights and uh, protection uh, of, uh, of uh, refugees and so on and so on. Uh, in the specific context of what's going on with Tibet. I find it interesting and to see like how Nepal will actually move forward because uh, I mean, obviously the, the meeting was just a few days ago, so no decision really can be uh, that fastly executed. Yeah. But uh, I think it will be interesting to see how much uh, of a choice Nepal will make as, uh, as uh, Gauravdi and Prakriti were speaking about, about non-alignment or an alignment. It will be interesting to see what will be uh, the strategic decision of Nepal if uh, they want to actually get closer to the idea of uh, the relationship with the European Union uh, with all its limitation or if uh, actually uh, they will align more of, uh, towards uh, um, cooperation and collaboration with uh, China. So I think uh, it's it's going to be interesting to unpack all the all the discussions that happened on the 24th and see uh, what really will transpire in in policies that will be uh, taken and that will be implemented uh, moving forward thank you Alois. Uh, i think with that we are completely out of time i am waiting for the organizers to chime me on it. Um, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's a very distinguished panel. I'm uh, glad you all were able to bring out uh, the number of elements in the discussion that you did. Uh, for want of time, I'm sorry we can't discuss this any further. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers as well. Um, perhaps the discussion could be had elsewhere and it could be continued. Uh, wishing you all the best. So we'll just log off. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.